Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is on the book of Psalms. Psalms. That book was written a long time ago, wasn't it? And we've all read it, surely. Is there something new we need to learn? Well, I, I've learned quite a few things from this series. Let's look and see what we can learn from lesson number 11. It's the lesson from March 16 of 2024, entitled, Longing for God in Zion. As usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, as we think now of your creative powers, of your sustaining powers, of all that you do for us, the ways in which you protect us and care for us each day, how can we ever give you enough thanks? How can we ever realize our total dependence upon you. And yet we live in a world where so few people recognize their need of you. May we begin to remedy that problem as we study today as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. For what are we longing? Is it for God? Is it for Zion? To get an idea of what the Bible teaches about Zion, we will study Psalm 46, these are specific psalms that really talk about Zion. 46, 84, 87, 122, and 125. Well, there's a lot to choose from, so there's a handful. Our Bible study guide says, Jim? The songs of Zion are joyous hymns that magnify the beauty of Zion and the sovereignty of, of the Lord, who reigns from his holy mountain. These psalms often praise the merits of the Lord's house and express a love for the sanctuary that can be found in other psalms as well. Many of these psalms were composed by the sons of Korah, who had firsthand experience of the blessedness of the Lord's house at the temple, me, as the temple musicians, 1 Chronicles 6, 31 to 38, and keeps me, Keeper. And keepers of the temple gates, First Chronicles 9, 19. Okay, Korah. Does that ring any bells in your mind? Korah, Dathan of Byron? Yeah. First Chronicles 6, 31 to 38, and First Chronicles 9, 19, we just looked at, tells us that the descendants of Korah, who was swallowed up by the ground with the families of Dathan and Abiram during the wilderness wanderings, became keepers and singers for the temple. Now, how is that possible? I thought they were swallowed up. Jennifer? From Numbers chapter 26, verses 9 to 11. These are the Datham and Abiram who were chosen by the community. They defied Moses and Aaron and joined the followers of Korah when they rebelled against the Lord. The ground opened and swallowed them, and they died with Korah and his followers when fire destroyed 250 men. They became a warning to the people but the sons of Korah were not killed. Okay, so what does that suggest to you? Mm. That the earth opened up. Well, I, I think as far as our discussion right now, the main point is the sons of Korah were not involved in the rebellion. Yeah. Pretty, it seems pretty obvious, right? Now, when you say sons of Korah, are you talking about his family? This would be his descendants, yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, this would be, see, he lived in the days of Moses. Right. The Psalms were written 500 to 400 years later. Right. So this is, he'd be his descendants. And they were, well, of course, he was one of the Levites and one of the chosen groups of people that were supposed to be looking after the temple and so forth. And so his descendants apparently were faithful followers and, and uh, were be given very prominent positions, primarily musicians and gatekeepers. Okay, Duane, you want to look at that? What else we can learn there? What makes Zion the source of hope and joy? Zion represented God's living presence among his people. As the people of Israel are God's chosen, oh, as the people of Israel are God's chosen people in Deuteronomy 7 and 6, so Zion is God's chosen mountain. Psalms 78, 68, Psalm 87, 2. God reigns from Zion and founded his temple on Zion as well. Thus, Zion is a place of divine blessings and refuge. 
Zion is often referred to in a parallel or even interchangeably with Jerusalem and the sanctuary, the center of God's work of salvation for the ancient world. Now I'm going to raise a question right now. I want you to think about right through this lesson and let's see if we can sort of work out an answer to it. Do the Jews today still consider that area and that mountain as the dwelling place on this earth of God? And if that's true, should we as Seventh-day Adventists give it certain reverent consideration? So we shall focus on the tropic, on the trope or topic of Zion as expressed in the book of Psalms. And we'll look at those Psalms we already mentioned. Psalms is full of hope and the expectation of the righteous to visit and dwell securely in God's sanctuary, a refuge of safety and peace. Now, let's try to paint that picture a little more clearly. Suppose you lived at a time and in a place where a few miles away, there's an enemy nation that could at any moment decide to attack you. How would you feel about God offering you peace? <laughs> that would be a pretty, a pretty serious issue, right? Okay. So, Jim, you want to look at those two, two verses there? Uh, Deuteronomy 7, 6. Do this because you belong to the Lord your God from the peoples on earth who he chose you to be his own special people. Does, so, that make you, does that make you feel left out? <laughs> uh, we could have a long discussion, perhaps. Yeah. <laughs> Psalms 68, verse 68. Instead, he chose the tribe of Judah and Mount Zion, which he dearly loves. Okay, so God loves Mount Zion for some particular reason. Let's see if we can nail that down in any respect. For a nation, now let's think about this. From a, for a nation that considered itself as a theocracy, what do we mean when we say theocracy? That was it, did the nation consider themselves a theocracy? They, they were supposed to, put, put it that well, way. Well, but, but God, that means God controls. Yeah. And God does not control. You have freedom. Well, this is, God rules. It doesn't mean, theocracy mean God rules. It doesn't mean necessarily that he controls. It means he's... Well, krat is, krat is uh, in Greek, I understand. Yeah. It has to do with, with control. And kratia is self-control. Yeah. And, and you can't, and if everybody's expects somebody else to control, then you're going to have uh, rules and record keeping and punishments and all kinds of stuff yeah. that goes with it. So anyway, let's... Well, so, and we have a democracy. Are yeah, we well, that ought to be a, a clue a, oh. <laughs> of, a, of a failure. Okay, well, go ahead. Okay, where was I at? Uh, Directly ruled by God. Number three there. I'm sorry. I was. I, I just did the text, and you were. You, yeah. I thought you were going to read. The present, presence of that God was a very important aspect of the, their existence. Repeatedly in the Psalms, God told them that Zion was His place of residence. We, of course, recognize that God's residence is not fixed to one spot, but He chose Zion to represent. Now here's a. We're using trying to choose our words carefully, to represent His presence among them and us. Do we still think the same? Okay, God's presence was connected to the presence of the Ark of the Covenant, or Covenant Box, which was built at Sinai after God appeared on the mountain. It was then transferred to Shiloh, and then finally to Jerusalem, to the place called Zion. <clears throat> Several of the people who wrote Psalms had active conversations with God. Would that make you, if you really knew that someone's actually having an active conversation with God, would you be more inclined to believe what they wrote down? I hope so. Think of the stories of Moses and David particularly. We just, just a couple that we could mention. Did that help them to understand him? 
Did the psalmist understand God better than most of us do? Well, let's think now about the temple of God. How did the psalmist regard the temple of God? From Psalm, yeah, yeah, go ahead. From Psalm chapter 20, 84, Psalm 84, verses 1 through 4. How I love your temple, Lord Almighty. <laughs> How I want to be there. I long to be in the Lord's temple. With my whole being, I sing for joy to the living God. Even the sparrows have built a nest, and the swallows have their own home. They keep their young near your altars. How happy are those who live in your temple, always singing praise to you from the Good News Bible. Okay, again, now I'm going to ask you a question. Is this talking about Solomon's temple? Now, in the days prior, starting from the days of Moses, their worship place was a tabernacle or a tent. None of these places were intended for somebody to live in. But we do learn later that in the, in the buildings connected to Solomon's temple, there were places for people to live, and presumably these would be the guards or whatever like that. I mean, there was a lot of wealth there, so they want, I'm sure they wanted to protect it. So, anyway. Um. Do you want me to do the Bible study guy? No, I'll do that. The psalmist longs and faints to make the sanctuary his permanent abode so that he can be near God forever. Now, would that be only appropriate for a Levite to say? Nobody else would be allowed to dwell there, right? Okay. Uh, God's living presence makes the sanctuary a unique place. In the sanctuary, worshipers can, quote, behold the beauty of the Lord, end quote, and be satisfied with the goodness of his house. In Psalm 84, the unparalleled happiness is achieved in relationship with God, which consists of praising him, finding strength in him, and trusting him. The sanctuary is a place where such a relationship is nourished through worship and fellowship with fellow believers. The living presence of God in the sanctuary gives the worshipers a glimpse of God's glorious kingdom and a taste of eternal life. If you were allowed to approach Solomon's temple, let's just give that as an example. Would you feel like that was a taste of eternal life? What about Herod's temple where Jesus went? Not too sure, huh? These, these sounds like, like these people are bedazzled by things and a lot of fantasy. Mm -hmm. Well, this is, they're trying to represent what the psalm says. Now, th this, this sanctuary we're talking about here, this is still, this is still the original sanctuary, isn't it? Well, this, these, these, most of these psalms are written after the days of David. So the next king was Solomon, and he would have been built the temple. So now we don't know. We, I don't know, have any way of knowing whether these psalms were written before that temple was actually constructed or after it was constructed. It would be about that time. So just a, a ballpark kind of figure. You know, either way, the, the thing that strikes me is the, the writer clearly has a, has a longing and a desire to be near God, near yeah. near in his presence, but I, well, I, wonder, altar, I wonder if there were 7,000 in all of Israel who felt yeah. the same way. Yeah. And again, I'm going to remind you, what if your enemies live five miles away? Would that make you more inclined <laughs> to want to live in God's presence? Well, and just to let you know about that, what, what that finally meant, in the time when the Romans finally conquered Jerusalem, and this happened with the Babylonians as well, conquered Jerusalem, the Jews all fled to the temple, believing that being in God's temple would protect them. So that's a, that's a outgrowth of these verses we're reading. Is there some sentiment like that today? Well, I can tell you their plans have all been run up and everything for eliminating the mosque that's on top of the mountain and building a new temple. Well, what about our church down the street? Well, is that the dwelling place of God? Well. I mean, remember, these are places, 
we're going to read this a little bit later, but let me just mention it right now. Both the tent tabernacle, which was dedicated at Sinai and lived, they used for 400 years, and the Temple of Solomon later that was served for in the next, what is that, 500 years or so, 600 years, both of those sanctuaries were dedicated with God's presence. God's presence came down and entered that way. It was obvious that people could see it. God's presence was there, and not even the priests could go in there. So I, I mean, I might be one of those old fogies, but I think that if I had seen something like that, I would, I would consider that pretty serious, mm -hmm. pretty, pretty big deal. Well, why do you suppose the psalmist felt such inspiration and happiness when the, they thought about God's dwelling place? Look especially at Psalm 84. One day spent in your temple is better than a thousand anywhere else. Mm -hmm. Well, does that give you a clue? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> One reason why the psalmist felt such a longing for God's temple is that they believed that God's blessings radiated out from the sanctuary location so that the closer one lived in Mount, to Mount Zion, the closer she or he was to God's blessings. This was a continuation of the fact that God dwelt in the sanctuary in the midst of the children of Israel during the wilderness wanderings. So first of all, it was God that said he wanted to dwell in the midst of the people. And then in the response, they said, well, okay, that sounds like a good idea. Let's identify a place that that's where God is. I want to be as close to God as possible. And I, I was just looking at some ancient, some pictures from ancient times and recently in this last week, and I happened to come across some pictures of the, a, par, a portion of the ancient wall built by Solomon, then expanded by Herod and so forth. And some of those stones that were put in place there were, were carved and developed or whatever they did, did to them miles and miles and miles away. And then they were transported like that and put in place without any mechanical advice, uh, no, no, nothing like we would use today. And some of them weigh as much, one at least weighs as much as 160 tons. I mean, and they fit so tightly together, you can't put a piece of paper between them. Now, you know, just you, you look at that a couple of times, and, and that's, what, that's the Western Wall that the, where the Jews worship today. You look at that and you say, this isn't a human doing. I mean, you, you have to believe that you're looking at God's handiwork right there in front of you. You can watch up, walk up and touch it. So, David especially realized that it was God who went out with him to battle against his enemies. But not only David, but also many of the other psalmists were continually praying for peace for Jerusalem. And they, re and they realized that apart from God's presence and God's guidance and protection, peace would not be possible. If it was a blessed thing to live close to God's presence at Mount Zion, it would also be a blessing to travel there for one of the three annual celebrations that the children of Israel were required to attend. And we read about that in one of, the, one of many places in Psalm 122, verses 1 to 5. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the Lord's house. Now let's think about this for a moment. Let's just take, for example, a family that lives in Galilee. It's about 70 miles. They, have to go, they would have to go down to the southern end of the Sea of Galilee, cross the Jordan River, because they, didn't want to, they, they were afraid to walk through the territory, try to march through the territory of the Samaritans. So they would go down the, the east side of the Jordan River among the Gentile cities and so forth, the ten towns, all the way down to Jericho. Then they would, uh, down to opposite Jericho, then they would cross the Jordan River again and then climb up that steep path up to Jerusalem. And they would, and that would take about a week each way, going and coming. And this was their, this was their vacation. This was their holiday. And they would do that in, they didn't go one or two people here and there. They would go in huge crowds. 
all together. And this is a chance to be with their friends, to talk with their friends. They're, all they had to do was, they had food prepared that they took with them. This was a vacation. <laughs> so that's what we're talking about here. Let us go to the Lord's house, and now we are here, standing inside the gates of Jerusalem. Jerusalem is a city restored in beautiful order and harmony. This is where the tribes come, the tribes of Israel, to give thanks to the Lord, according to his command. Here the kings of Israel sat to judge their people. And that's another aspect there. Remember that if you had, I mean, this was the Supreme Court. In their day, it was the king who would presumably administer God's justice. Psalm 122 expresses the pilgrims' excitement upon their arrival at Jerusalem. The pilgrimage to, pilgrimages to Jerusalem were joyful occasions when God's people joined together three times during the year to commemorate God's goodness toward them in the past and present, Deuteronomy 16, 16. Jerusalem was the center of the nation's life because it contained the testimony of Israel, Psalm 122 again, and the thrones of Thrones for Judgment, Psalm 122, verse 5. The testimony of Israel refers to the sanctuary that was at times called, quote, the tabernacle of the testimony, end quote, Numbers 150, and contained the Ark of the Testimony, Exodus 25. The thrones set for judgment depict the judicial system in Jerusalem, which we've just talked about. Pilgrimage was thus the time when one could seek and obtain justice. If you felt like you had not you, you had been wrong somehow or other. You not only came up there to worship for that particular holiday, but you were there to see that justice was done. Faithfulness to God and administering justice to people were, were never to be separated from our Bible study guide. Traveling to Jerusalem for one of the feast celebrations was a, was a great vacation for the children of Israel. It was a time for, of celebration and rejoicing, and they uh, recognize that praying for peace in Jerusalem would mean peace for all of them. So how should these ideas be expressed and carried out by Seventh-day Adventists, Christians in 2024? What made Jerusalem such a special place? Tim? Psalms 87 verses 1 and 2. The Lord built his city on the sacred hill more than any other place in Israel. He loves the city of Jerusalem. Good News Bible. Okay, Jennifer, you want to take that Bible study guide there? Sure, Bible study guide. Psalm 87 is a hymn celebrating Zion as God's specially chosen and beloved city. The foundation of God's temple is on Mount Zion from Psalm 2.6 and Psalm 15.1. Now we know that in actual fact, it's on Mount Moriah. But now what we're seeing here is they're starting to talk about, the, it's, it's not that one's a little spot in Jerusalem they call Mount Zion today. Mount Zion was Jerusalem, or the place of God, anyway. At the end of time, Zion will rise above all mountains, signifying the Lord's sovereign supremacy over the whole world. Read Psalm 99, verse 2, Isaiah 2, 2, and Micah 4, 1. Psalm 87 refers to Zion as, quote, mountains to highlight its majesty. Read Psalm 133, verse 3. God loves the gates of Zion, quote, more than all the dwellings of Jacob, from Psalm 87, verse 2, from New King James Version, expressing the superiority of Zion over all other places in Israel that were special gathering places of God's people in the past, such as Shiloh and Bethel. Thus, the psalm affirms that true worship of God is in his chosen place and in his prescribed way. Okay, now I'm going to ask you the next question. Do we feel the same way about our local church? Should we? Don't everybody talk at once. <laughs> well, we, we believe that God is here. He's at church. Wherever we worship, He's there. But in what sense was he in Jerusalem in a special sense? What, what, what does that imply in our study? Well, what was his purpose to be there? What was his mission? Well, of course, you know, as we suggested, um, it, their, their nation was supposed to be a theocracy, so they were, it was supposed to be the place where, I mean... Is that what God... Did, is there any place that where you can... Just, 
say that Yahweh says, I want to control you. Seems to me in Genesis 1, he says, uh, take dominion two places. In other words, take, take control yeah. of the world, but doesn't take, say, control other people. Yeah, but, that's, but that was before sin entered the world. But sin was already here. Is there any, in the Garden of Eden? It was, it was before. Oh, not, not when God said that. He, that, was, that was said at the point of creation. It hadn't well, it was already with the, with the uh, added, excuse me, the uh, Satan and his uh, Elohim. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it, what, what was what God been attempting to do all these th thousands of years is to bring harmony, a state of atonement, throughout his creation. Yeah, well, how does he do that? Well, that's, that's what we need to be, I think, is ver a very important question. And, and in this context, the idea is suge being suggested is that we eventually all need to come to a some kind of a spiritual Jerusalem, which is God's, uh, the closer we come to God, the closer we come to each other. Jennifer, you want to take up Isaiah 2-2 there? Sure. Isaiah 2-2. In days to come, the mountain where the temple stands will be the highest one of all, towering, towering above all the hills. Many nations will come stream streaming to it from the Good News Bible. There you go, Jim. You see, that's what's supposed to happen. The psalmist and the prophet Isaiah both recognize that one day, Jerusalem will be the center of the universe and the place where God dwells forever. Dwayne? Listen, city of God, to the wonderful things he says about you. I will include Egypt and Babylonia, which I list when I list the nations that obey me. I will number among the inhabitants of Jerusalem the people of Philistia, Tyre, and Ethiopia. Of Zion, it will be said that all nations belong there and that the Almighty will make her strong. The Lord will write a list of the peoples and include them all as citizens of Jerusalem. They dance and sing. In Zion is the source of all our blessings. Now, here's another question I would like all of you to think, including you out there, think about. Will we be able to identify in the new earth, in the earth made new, Will we be able to identify places like, we know about Jerusalem, but what about Ethiopia, Europe, North America? Or will the, will the whole earth be completely remade so nothing's identifiable? Think about it. It's hard to know for sure how the children of Israel understood this passage in the days when they were surrounded by their enemies. But this passage suggests that from Egypt to Mesopotamia, which is current Iraq today, the people would be going to Jerusalem to worship God. And that's, that's our goal, isn't it? Okay, Psalm 87 says, points for salvation of both the Jews and the Gentiles, and they're being united in one church through Christ's redeeming ministry. And a number of verses for that. The Psalms portrayals of the prosperity of Zion is reminiscent of Daniel's vision of God's kingdom becoming an enormous mountain that fills the whole earth. Remember that stone that was chipped, chipped out of the side of the mountain without hands and it filled the whole earth. And of Jesus' parable about God's kingdom growing into a huge tree that hosts the birds of the air, Matthew 13. That's from the Bible study guide. Okay, Jim, Galatians 3. Uh, verses 28 and 29. So there is no difference between Jews and Gentiles, between slaves and free people, between men and women. You are all one in union with Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are the descendants of Abraham and will receive what God has promised. Good News Bible. Okay, you want to take the next verse as well? Colossians 3, verse 11. As a result, there is no longer any distinction between Gentiles and Jews, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarians, savages, slaves, and free. But Christ is all. Christ is in all. Good news, Bible. So if we're going to believe Paul, who wrote these two passages, is there any distinction between Gentiles and Jews? No. Yeah. He doesn't, he doesn't have a big argument about, okay, do you need to be circumcised to be a, you know, a descendant of Abraham, da-da-da, whatever it is. No. He just says, we're all descendants of Abraham. 
This appeal that Zion was supposed to be the future headquarters for all the ancient Near East suggests a similarity to Christ's commission to the disciples to spread the good gospel to the whole world. Jennifer? From Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 to 20. Jesus drew near and said to them, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Go then to all peoples everywhere and make them my disciples. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. And I will be with you always to the end of the age. And the good news. Bible. Okay, and there's, um, there are many, many references, as you probably already noticed, in this particular lesson. We will not have time to read all of them, but that similar idea is expressed in Psalm 46 way back in the Old Testament. Our Bible study guide goes on. This Psalm, Psalm 46, is focusing on, gives a vivid description of the world in turmoil. And it is portrayed with images of natural uh, disasters of unprecedented intensity. The image of distorted waters often, I'm sorry, disturbed waters often depicts the rebellious nations and various problems that the wicked cause uh, in the world. And you remember that in Revelation 17, I believe it is, it says that in prophetic terms that waters represent peoples. Likewise, in Psalm 46, the images of natural calamities depict the, the world controlled by nations waging wars. Of course, do we have nations waging wars today? Mm -hmm. Well, the contrast between what is supposed to happen to our world and the security of Zion, the dwelling place of God, suggests that no matter how bad things might seem to be here on this earth, God will still dwell with his faithful people and preserve them. Could that be true in 2024 through 2030? While well, God recognizes that terrible times are coming at the end of this world's history, how will he respond? Where are we at? Dwayne, I think that's yours. Psalm 46, 46 8 to 11. <clears throat> Come and see what the Lord has done. See what amazing things he has done on earth. He stops wars all over the world. He breaks bows, destroys spears, and sets shields on fire. Stop fighting, he says, and know that I am God, supreme among the nations, supreme over the world. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Wow. So our Bible study guide goes on. God responds with such a force of displeasure that his word, which had created the earth, now causes the earth to melt. Hmm. Yet the melting does not end in destruction, but Renewal. Notice that God extends his peace from Zion to the ends of the earth. God will make wars cease and extinguish the, look, the tools of destruction, which the wicked nations use to bring oppression into the world. This is the great hope that Christians have, which will occur, of course, at the second coming of Jesus. Can we learn to have peace and to, thus, and to trust God in a world that indeed has so much turmoil, even war? And how does this contrast with God's promise to his, the psalmist about Jerusalem? See Psalm 46, 2 as above in item number 15. And then Psalm 125, verses 1 and 2. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which can never be shaken, never be moved. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people now and forever. Good news, Bible. Now let's think about this. I want, I want you to really, let's take a moment to really think about this. In the final events of this earth's history, mountains will be thrown into the sea and the wicked with them. That's predicted in the Bible. Okay? But God's dwelling place in Zion will be steadfast and strong. Also predicted in the Bible. Why wouldn't everyone want to be converted to that, uh, connected, I'm sorry, to that strength supplied by God? I mean, if, if you know that there's a possibility that the mountain you're living on is going to be thrown into the sea, but there's another place you could go that's perfectly safe, where would you, go, where would you be? Let me stand on the top of the mountain? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't think so. 
God realizes that so long as we are here on this world, there will be times when it seems like the wicked are succeeding and the righteous are in trouble. But the psalmists assure us that that will not always be the case. We, can, we may look with envy to the wicked as they succeed, but we need to remember that ultimately it is God's faithful people who will go to heaven. And then look at another passage, another whole chap almost a whole chapter, Psalm 73, 2 through 13, which will Ellen White comments about uh, Jim. Okay, from the writer Ellen White, the entrance of sin into the world, the incarnation of Christ, regeneration, the resurrection, and many other subjects presented in the Bible are mysteries too deep for the human mind to explain or even fully to comprehend. But we have no reason to doubt God's word because we cannot understand the mysteries of his providence. Everywhere are wonders beyond our, can, that is our range of knowledge. Should we then be surprised to find that the, to find in the spiritual world also there are mysteries that we cannot fathom? The difficulty lies solely in the weakness and narrowness of the human mind. God has given us the scriptures sufficiently evident excuse me, in the scriptures, sufficient evidence of their divine character, and we are not to doubt his word because we cannot understand all the mysteries of his providence. Ellen White, Steps of Christ, pages 106 to 107. Okay, if we could understand everything about the plan of salvation, what would we have to study for the rest of eternity? Isaiah 40 and Psalm 51, 1 through 16 are passages of great comfort. To God's faithful people. We notice that distant lands wait for God to come their way with the hope for God's salvation. Jennifer, you want to take that next one there? Sure, from the Bible Study Guide. The Songs of Zion make an absolute commitment to staying mindful of Zion and the living hope in God's sovereign reign that it represents. While many blessings of God's sanctuary are experienced in this life, the hope in the fullness of life and joy in Zion is still in the future. Many of God's children long for the heavenly Zion with tears. See Psalm 137, verse 1. To remember Zion implies not merely an occasional thought, but also a deliberate mindfulness and decision to live in accordance with that living memory. Okay, so this is not just, okay, have you, have you visited Jerusalem on this earth and you can remember, oh yeah, I have a picture in my mind what it looks like. No, we're talking about living in God's presence, right? Singing songs of praise and adoration of God should, as it did for the Jews, remind us that the final solution will be the second coming of Jesus. Dwayne? Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven and the first earth disappeared and the sea vanished. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared and ready, like a bride dressed to meet her husband. I heard a loud voice speaking from the throne. Now God's home is with human beings. He will live with them and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and he will be their God. He will wipe away all tears from their eyes. There will be no more death, no more grief or crying or pain. The old things have disappeared. Then the one who sits on the throne said, And now I make all things new. He also said to me, Write this, because these words are true and can be trusted. Okay, and Ella White comments, These are wonderful words. I love to read these words. Their immortal minds will contemplate with never-failing delight the wonders of creative power, the mysteries of redeeming love, there is no cruel, deceiving foe to attempt the forgetfulness of God. Every faculty will be devoted, every capacity increased, developed, I'm sorry, every faculty will be developed, every capacity increased. The, acquisition, the acquirement of knowledge will not weary the mind or exhaust the energies. There the grandest enterprises may be carried forward, the loftiest aspirations reached, the highest ambitions realized, and still 
There will arise new heights to surmount, new wonders to admire, new truths to comprehend, fresh objects to call forth the powers of mind and soul and body. So another, that's from Great Controversy 677. God has a lot of things he still wants, us to, wants to show us and teach us, right? Mm -hmm. All of these promises should convince us never to think of this earth as a permanent home. We await a better land. Amen. Paul, the probable author, amen, right. Paul, the probable author of Hebrews, suggested that even today we can be a part of Zion. Hebrews 12, verses 22 through 24. Instead, you have, been, you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, with its thousands of angels. You have come to the joyful gathering of God's firstborn, whose n names are written in heaven. You have come to God, who is the judge of all people and to the spirits of good people made perfect. You have come to Jesus, who, who arranged the new covenant and to the sprinkled blood that promises much better things than does the blood of Abel. It is essential that we recognize that God's plan is to include people from every race, tribe, language, and nation. Of course, those are the words from Revelation. As Seventh-day Adventists who have the writings of Ellen White, in addition to what the Bible teaches us, we should recognize that troublous times are still ahead of us. When the time of trouble comes, Satan will do everything that he can to get God's people to join his side in the great controversy. If he cannot get them to join his side, he will do everything he can to try to destroy them. Read about that in Revelation 13, 15 to 18. It is important to recognize that the idea of Zion includes geography, politics, and theology. And those verses which we already mentioned, I'm sorry, those passages, the, the chapters in the Bible, which talk about Zion. Jim? The concept of Zion in the scriptures is itself a mix of geograph geography, politics, and theology. We shall consider these different aspects in order to grasp Zion's spiritual meaning for God's people in the past as well as for ourselves, who are in, in urgent need today of the hope that Zion offers from the Bible study guide. Mount Moriah is located near Mount Zion, very near, I might add, and should be included in all that we say about the dwelling place of God. It was there that Abraham was prepared to offer Isaac, his only son, Genesis 22. It was there that the plague was stopped in the days of, of David, 2 Samuel 24. The Bible study guide goes on, Jennifer. The location of Mount Zion in Jerusalem in relation to Mount Moriah has important theological significance. David conquered Mount Zion, you can read that in 2 Samuel and 1 Chronicles, occupying a relatively small area of the hill that came to be called the city of David. To the north, about 600 meters away, stood Mount Moriah, where Isaac had been offered in sacrifice from Genesis 22. Here also the angel of the Lord stood by the threshing floor of Eruna, the Jebusite, and was halted in the midst of destroying Israel in consequence of the sin of David, who attempted to carry out a census second, from 2 second Samuel, contrary to God's will. Okay, now, let's think about this for a moment. If you knew that you were a direct descendant of Isaac, and that your ancestor was potentially offered at that spot, would you want to visit that place? I would. I would think so. I mean, that, that would be a national you know, memorial of some kind, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. And then David. Think about it. That's when the plague stopped. Solomon's temple. I'm sorry. Dwayne, that would be yours. Okay. Solomon's temple and its outbuildings also were built on this same spot. See 2 Chronicles 3.1. The city of Jerusalem extended to the north and embraced the holy mountain, and eventually the name Zion came to include the Temple Mount. As we have seen in the Psalms, Zion often refers to the city of Jerusalem as a whole. See a number of passages there from Psalms. Yeah. So... What this lesson is trying to get us to realize is that that entire 
area of Jerusalem, at least at some point in time, maybe in the days of David or something like this, God said, okay, I want you to, to treat this spot as if it's my dwelling place. Uh, that's that's what I, the way I read that. And what evidence do we have that, that was a, those were remarkable places? Well, look at some examples. Exodus 25, 8 and 9. The people must make a sacred tent for me so that I may live among them. Make it and all its furnishings according to the plan that I will show you. And where did that happen? Where did that take place? In the wilderness. In the wilderness at the foot of Mount Sinai, where they were camped for a year in the process of building this tabernacle. When the tent was finished, a tabernacle and tent, that's the same word, Exodus 40, 34 to 36, then the cloud covered the tent and the dazzling light of the Lord's presence filled it. Because of this, Moses could not go into the tent. I mean, this is somebody who had spent 40 days and 40 nights in the mountain with God's, you know, and elsewhere it says he talked to God face to face. So, what do you think is happening here? The Israelites moved their camp in another place only when the cloud lifted from the tent. I mean, I have often talked to people, I've encouraged people to read through Exodus in groups and, and through, through much of the Bible. And I, I want you to think about it like this. You see this cloud comes back, down and there's magnificent glory and it fills the temple so so powerful that not even Moses can go in would you be afraid to go in there after that I mean how would you feel about that piece of property or that, that piece of furniture that it was holy mm -hmm. it was holy I think I think yeah. that yeah um the Israelites moved their camp. As long as the cloud stayed there, they did not move their camp. During all their wanderings, they could see the cloud of the Lord's presence over the tent during the day and a fire burning above it during the night. And again, how would we feel if every movement was guided, I mean, visibly by God? Much later, when Solomon's temple was completed and the celebrations were, were ongoing, uh, where are we? I guess that's mine. Second Chronicles 7, 1 to 3. When King Solomon finished his prayer, now he's, this is at the dedication of Solomon's temple, fire came down from heaven and burnt up the sacrifice that had been offered and the dazzling light of the Lord's presence filled the temple. So imagine you hit this. I mean, this is... <clears throat> I, I don't think we've even come close to understanding what was going on there. I'm sure that the dedication of this temple, people from all the nations were around were invited to attend this celebration. All the Israelites, everybody who possibly could came there and you, a, a sacrifice is placed in front of the, on the altar. All the people are watching and fire comes down from heaven and burns up the sacrifice. And all those people who worship the idols what did they say? <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. I mean, what else could you say? When the, when the people of Israel saw the fire fall from heaven and the light filled the temple, they fell face downwards on the pavement, worshiping God and praising Him for His goodness and His eternal love. I mean, I, that's what I would do. I don't think there's any, any question about that. Jim? Uh, keep in mind that Jehovah is never confined to a specific mountain, nor is he limited to a particularly, excuse me, to a particular earthly location in the, in the Old Testament, because no location is in and of itself holy, although he is frequently linked to Sinai and Zion. God reveals himself in connection with a wide variety of mountains. He manifests his presence Wherever he desires, even Zion itself merits no special distinction as the earthly residence of the Lord. Rather, Zion is simply a, the footstool of a majesty that 
not even the heavens can contain, verse Kings 8, 27, and 2 Chronicles 6. So in other words, what, is there, what it's saying there is, it's not the dirt at that particular location that's some, got some special holiness to it, or even some building that's built on that spot that has a special... The only thing that makes it special is what? God's presence, right? Okay. Jennifer? 1 Kings 8.27 But can you, O God, really live on earth? Not even all heaven is large enough to hold you. So how can this temple that I have built be large enough? From the Good News Bible. And think of... This is, these are Solomon's words before huge, I mean, probably millions of people. Wonderful words, and yet think of how he deteriorated, how bad he got. Israel should never have forgotten the fact that God himself came down to bless Mount Moriah and Mount Zion when his presence filled the temple. He even, uh, not even the priests could enter. But Zion will not cease to exist um, in our future. Will not cease to exist in our future. Where are we? Whose turn? Dwayne. How is Zion portrayed in the scriptures? Mount Zion, which is a symbol of God's people, in Isaiah 29, 8, also is the place from, from which Jehovah fights against enemy nations, Isaiah 31, 4, who war against Israel. A remnant of Israel will go forth from Zion and be preserved, uh, promised in 2 Kings 19, 31. And to Zion they will return Israel. Salvation is found in Zion, this mount also relates to cosmic signs. Ultimately, the Lord will reign over his people in Mount Zion, in the earth made new. Okay, what evidence do we have that the new Jerusalem will come down at the site of the old Jerusalem? Zechariah says it will come down and the mountain will split in half and go north and south, and that's where the new Jerusalem will set down. So, there we have it. You want to go ahead and read us Isaiah 29? All the nations that assemble to attack Jerusalem will be like a starving person who dreams he is eating and wakes up hungry, or like <laughs> someone dying of thirst who dreams he is drinking and wakes with a dry throat. Wow. That's quite a pretty graphic description, huh? Okay, another location closely associated with Mount Zion and Mount Moriah is the Valley of Jehoshaphat. Notice what Joel said about that location. Joel 3, 1 through 17 speaks of the gathering of the nations in the Valley of Jehoshaphat, where God will contend with them in judgment and plead for the deliverance of his people. The Valley of Jehoshaphat is a symbolic name given to the place of ultimate judgment. Geographically, it was a deep ravine that separated Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, through which the Kidron flowed, uh, the stream. That's, and that, in the bottom of that stream, of course, was the bottom of that valley is the Garden of Gethsemane. Because of its location, the Valley of Jehoshaphat played a significant role in Israel's religious traditions and rituals. 1 Kings 1, 9 and 33, such as in the religious reforms of Asa, in the reigns of Jehoshaphat and Hezekiah, and in the future purification of Jerusalem. It was there that Solomon was anointed as monarch. Therefore, there was a close relationship between the Holy Mount or Zion with the judgment and coronation of the king. Um, and our Bible study guide, Jim, you want to take that one up? At the climax of the confrontation between the Lord and the nations, the Lord will roar from Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem, Joel 3.16, the New King James Version. And God's people will know that I am the Lord, your God, dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain, Joel I'm going to interrupt. I'm going to interrupt there for a second. What is implied when it says that God's people will know that I am the Lord, your God? I mean, if you, you know, you walk out in the street here and you ask somebody just passing by, you know, is, what do you know about God? Well, he's da-da-da. Or you take a Christians, almost any Christians who live in a Christian, I mean, who worship in a Christian church, 
they're going to say, yeah, we know God, we know about God. So this is, a, this is something more than that, right? Seems to me that it's because he, he embodies all of the characteristics that, are, that he's described himself as being in the Bible, and mm -hmm. that's, that's how they recognize him. Okay. You want to go ahead, Jim? The righteous? The righteous, uh, from Psalms 15, verses 2 to 5, are depicted as those who will dwell on the holy mountain of God, Psalms 15, 1. From whence God answers prayers, Psalms 3, 4. In contrast, those who forsake Jehovah forget his holy mountain, Isaiah 65, 11. The Lord chose to make the earthly Zion his center of action, not because it was inherently unique or valuable, but because he willed it so from the Bible study guide. God's future home will be on Mount Zion and the earth made new. And I think we've just about got time for you to read that. Jennifer? Micah 4 verses 1 through 4. In days to come, the mountain where the temple stands will be the highest one of all, towering above all the hills. Many nations will come streaming to it, and their people will say, Let us go up the hill of the Lord to the temple of Israel's God. From Zion he speaks to his people. He will settle disputes among the nations, among the great powers near and far. They will hammer their swords into plows and their spears into pruning knives. Nations will never again go to war, never prepare for battle again. Everyone will live in peace among his own vineyards and fig trees, and no one will make him afraid. The Lord Almighty has promised this, Psalm 99. So Psalm 99 concludes with a call for the people to exalt the Lord and worship Him at His holy mountain because of the forgiveness that um, God manifested toward them th there. As we see from our study, the holiness at Mount Zion once held as the abode of God was transferred to Zion after the people, after the temple was built there. Our Creator God is a most excellent teacher. He uses physical places and material things to express spiritual concepts, as in the case of the literal Mount Zion and its surrounding hills. Through this object lesson, Israelites could better understand God's redemption plan. And I'm just going to say there that what a pilgrimage it will be to, to travel to a place where you actually believe God existed. Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you so much for the blessings we enjoy at your hands. Help us to understand these things that you're trying to teach us is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.